I think so. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So if you, if you take the third, you take the third third, I don't think you anyone else. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, students. Uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome you to this inaugural lecture. It's in fact the first inaugural lecture we're having this year, although it is so late in the year. And in some ways, we must apologize for that. We've had a lot else on, but uh, we've, it's an important institution in the life of the university and in the life of academics. And uh, it's wonderful that, we are, that we've attracted a crowd of colleagues um, to fill the lecture theater and to get this tradition back on the road. Uh, you'll see that uh, we will be having inaugural lectures roughly two a month from now on. Uh, and it is an important way of showcasing the body of work that our academics uh, perform and have achieved. Becoming a professor, whether it's through an ad hominem promotion, as in this case, or whether it's through uh, recruitment for, through application for a chair, in many respects represents uh, the acme of someone's academic career. Of course, they have a long way to go still. Hopefully they have another 10, 20, 30 years of academic life ahead of them, uh, during which they will perform as professors. Uh, but this is the, this is the point uh, which most academics are aiming for uh, and is a, a mark that they've arrived. And the opportunity of an inaugural lecture is not just to celebrate the individual, the new professor, to honor them, uh, to pay tribute, but also to cross some of the boundaries that the silos that exist in academia. These are public lectures. Welcome, Professor Eddie. I'm going to introduce the platform party only after you've arrived. So, um, <laughs> um, Professor Eddie was chairing a meeting and had to uh, warn me that he would be just a few minutes late. Um, the the it's an opportunity, and we invite the public. You may have seen the, uh, the lecturers advertised in the newspapers. We invite people from across the university because it's one of those occasions and opportunities to speak not to an audience of experts who would, uh, who would uh, who, uh, add a, with a language and a jargon that would be unintelligible and impenetrable to most of us. The, the hallmark of an inaugural lecture is that it's a lecture for the public. Uh, and that means also for other academics to be able to understand what's being done and what's uh, in a different discipline. And hopefully may seed new ideas, new opportunities for trans and interdisciplinary research, uh, may uh, stimulate a student who's looking for a doctoral program uh, to embark or with new ideas uh, for opportunities they haven't had. So I would urge you to continue, although most of you no doubt have selected this inaugural lecture because you want to honor uh, Professor Langdon in particular, I would urge you to uh, look at the uh, program of inaugural lectures that lie ahead of us and to come to as many of them as possible and you'd be welcome. The inaugural lectures, as I say, are important also as a way of honoring the individual and reflecting that I want to introduce the platform party to you. Uh, starting uh, closest to me, the Dean of Engineering and Built Environment, Professor Alison Lewis, who will also introduce the speaker, the inaugural lecturer, uh, Professor Langdon, uh, Professor Rob Knutson, who is going to do the vote of thanks afterwards, and three of our Deputy Vice Chancellors, Professor Pakeng, Professor Reddy, and Professor Ferris. And I want to thank them as well, um, that all of, all of them are here uh, signaling uh, the, the, the stature of the individual and of the occasion. So I'm now going to invite Professor Lewis to do the introduction of the inaugural lecturer. Thank you very much to the VC. Professor Genevieve Langdon was born in Liverpool in 1977, the eldest of nine children. She lived on one of the largest government housing estates in the UK, in an area of high unemployment and low aspirations. The late 1970s in the UK was bleak. Economic decline, Thatcherism, brown and yellow polyester, 
sometimes called the decade that taste forgot. But the 1970s was also the decade of rebellion, miniskirts, and microwaves. Enter Genevieve Sarah Langdon, young and poor, but with big dreams, desperate to escape the poverty trap. She knew that a professional degree was the vehicle out. Both her parents trained and worked as nurses, but she rejected a career in nursing and medicine. Too gory, too much shift work, and she didn't enjoy the idea of holding a life in her hands. Originally, she wanted to be an astronaut and become the first woman in space. However, that would have involved learning Russian, and in any case, she was quickly beaten to that. So, from the age of 12, she determined that she would be an engineer, and after that, she never considered anything else. She went through both high school and university on financial aid and went on to graduate top of the faculty at the University of Liverpool with a first class honours degree in integrated engineering in 1999. She then continued with a PhD at the same university and studied the response of offshore structures like oil rigs to gas explosions. She visited UCT while she was still a PhD student and was teamed up with Steve Chung in the Blast Impact Survivability Research Unit for a few months. They wrote two papers together from that time, both of which have been cited more than 100 times. In 2001, she married Gareth, her high school sweetheart, and they now have the pleasure of having two boys together, David and Jonathan, who are now 13 and 7 years old. Shortly after David was born, in 2004, they moved to Cape Town, where she was offered a postdoctoral research fellowship, and they never left. Professor Langdon is currently a full professor and deputy head of the Mechanical Engineering Department at UCT, as well as the director of BISRU, a UCT-accredited research center. Her research interests are on the blast protection of structures and the use of sustainable materials in explosion-resistant applications. If you ever spend any amount of time on this side of upper campus, you'll be familiar with the regular sounds of a long whistle followed by a blast coming from maintenance place. That is Genevieve and her research team having a blast in the Bajru labs. <laughs> Genevieve has a prodigious publication record. For those who are interested, she has 93 publications, an H index of 27, and citations 2047 as of this afternoon. In the last few years, her lab has required a high-speed camera, and the first results have been published of what looks like the beginning of a set of breakthroughs identifying transient responsive structures in the first 20 to 150 microseconds of motion. There are many, many reasons to have the utmost respect for Professor Langdon, not the least of which is that she is the recipient of multiple awards, including the Southern African Association for the Advancement of Science Silver Medal for outstanding research by a person under 40 years old. More importantly, how can one not respect one of only three people at UCT who have a blasting certificate, <laughs> i.e., special permission from the South African Police Service, specifically Lieutenant Colonel B.E. Posthumus, Chief Inspector of Explosives. <laughs> this permission allows explosives to be obtained from Rhine Metal and Denel munitions conveyed by motor vehicle to the Department of Mechanical Engineering UCT and used at the blast room at Bizru, provided that not more than one kilograms are stored at any one time and with due concern for safety and prevention of injury as specified by the Explosive Act 26 of 1956. Respect. <laughs> Strangely enough, for somebody who detonates explosives on a regular basis, she cannot stand balloons bursting. <laughs> she likes reading theology books and exploring the big questions of life. Why are we here? What is God like? And what ultimately matters? She is involved as a leader in a local church, leading worship, mentoring young people, and sometimes preaching. She also really likes chocolate and cheesecake. And with that, I invite Genevieve to give her inaugural lecture.
Wow. <laughs> what a moment. I wasn't quite sure how I would feel um, giving my inaugural lecture. On the one hand, it feels a bit like an anticlimax because I've actually been a professor for quite a while. But at the same time, it's a little bit like getting married. It's a, it's a bit of a rite of passage in academia. Uh, the similarities don't end. A lot of people pitch up. There's a lot of photographs taken. And you have to wear a strange gown. <laughs> Although I have worn this one more than once, I can't say the same thing for my wedding dress. <laughs> so uh, there's a lot of you here who have come to hear me talk for 40 minutes about my research, hopefully using words that sound a bit like English. And uh, I'm wondering why some of you came. So I'm looking out, some of you I recognize, your longtime colleagues and friends, family, um, people from church that I know, uh, colleagues in other departments and faculties. And some of you are my students. Welcome to my students. I'm so pleased so many of you came. Um, yeah. And for some of you, I don't recognize at all. And I wonder what made you come to this. <laughs> <laughs> Explosion protection, reality or fantasy, um, that you would give up time to come and listen to me. So thank you all for coming. I'm not very good at the formal welcomes. As you hear, I didn't really grow up in this kind of environment, but thank you so much for being here, and you're very welcome. Um, so I wonder what you thought when you heard about my topic. I'm sure some of you are here because you know me in other um, spheres of life, and you're wondering, how does that this fit with the person you know? Um, and so I, I hope tonight you won't be too frightened or um, afraid um, when you hear about what I do. <laughs> Um, and so uh, let's get started without any further ado. So as you heard, we arrived in Cape Town in 2004. Gareth, that's a long time ago now. And, and that's a picture of David, my youngest on the left with, with Gareth. And he was just a small baby when we came here. And then in 2010, we had a new arrival, which is Jonathan. So I want to say special welcome to Gareth, Jonathan, and David today. And uh, it, a lot has happened in the interim years. It wouldn't be complete as well without thanking all of the people that I've worked with in the Bisri Lab over the years. I can't name you all, and some of you are students who've gone through and some of you are academics. And so to Trevor, it's been a pleasure to work with you. To Steve, we've irritated each other and worked together and stretched each other lots. And I'm very grateful to you. And to Gerald, to my mentor for many, many years. Um, I wouldn't be here if it were not for you. At the point at which I came to UCT, my confidence was low. Um, and I wasn't sure whether this was the life for me and whether I could make it. Uh, but you instill belief in myself and in Bisri and in what I do that, that has carried me this far. And I'm very grateful to you. And to Ruben, PhD student, but now colleague, um, the man who babysat David while I was giving birth to Jonathan. I'm super grateful to you on many fronts of my life. Uh, and to Chris, you're here too. Uh, you're not strictly a member of Bisri, but we count you as part of the Bisri family. And I just thank you for the impact you've had on my work. And so be, I just wanted to acknowledge my colleagues. Uh, while I'm the one up at the front tonight getting all of the praise and accolades, they're really the ones that do most of the hard work. And I just get to stand here and take most of the credit. That works well for me. <laughs> Hopefully it works well for them as well. So some of you who are here, particularly the students, you thought, wow, explosions, they're amazing. And the, the number one rule of explosions is be cool, don't look. When you do an explosion, in all the movies, you see the, the good guy, the hero, the spy, whatever, just walks away. They don't even look. They're too cool to look. <laughs> now, unfortunately, I don't look anything like the Black Widow, and I'm also not as cool as she is. So I look a lot at explosions. And, um, <laughs> and so what I really do on a regular basis is look at the effects that explosions have. And so that's where the topic of my talk tonight comes from, uh, looking at explosion protection, and whether that's something real or whether that's just a fantastic dream that we have. Um, so before we get into that, I thought we'd talk about maybe why do explosions happen? And explosions have many causes, and sometimes they are minor accidents that can happen. And, and this poor guy is a, a small business owner in Mwazi. And at the beginning of this year, there was an explosion at an electrical substation in Amwazi. 
And it was a minor explosion in that nobody was really badly injured, but it left hundreds of thousands of people without electricity for five days. So, so this man showing you that the goods in his freezer that's defrosting that he won't be able to sell soon. Um, and what followed on from that were protests on the Mangasuzu Highway um, about this lack of electricity and the, the fact that service was not restored sooner. I'm sure in the rich suburbs of Cape Town where I live, had the electricity gone out, it wouldn't have been five days before it was restored. So even when technically no one gets injured, explosions can have terrible effects. But of course, what we usually think of when we think about explosions is something more like this. So this is Tianjin, that's a Chinese port. This is a couple of years ago now. This accident started as a fire in one of the port area buildings. Unknown to the firefighters who responded to the fire, there were lots of chemicals, dangerous chemicals, tons of dangerous chemicals stored in these buildings, way more than the, they were legally allowed. And when the firefighters arrived to put out the fire, they started spraying water. They doused these chemicals in water, and as they doused the flames, within 40 minutes, a huge explosion occurred. An overheated container of nitrocellulose exploded. A magnitude 2.3 earthquake was the result. A second explosion, 800 tons of ammonium nitrate, exploded next. Magnitude 2.9 on the Richter scale. A few days later, three days later in fact, eight additional explosions occurred. 173 people died, including 95 firefighters. 11 police officers. The air and water were contaminated. Sodium cyanide was released into the air. White foam covered the streets, and although the Chinese government said it was harmless, most people disagreed, as did the fish in the rivers that died. The economic cost of this particular explosion was nine billion US dollars. China prosecuted 49 government officials and warehouse executives for their roles in this. Um, all of whom were, were imprisoned or on one thing or another. The chairman of the logistics company was sentenced to death with a two-year reprieve, meaning if he's good for those two years, they won't kill him. Um, so I, I haven't heard whether he's been killed or not, but he's, he was on death row as of a month ago. Um, that's the seriousness with which explosions um, accidental ones, not intended explosions. And of course, the ones that we tend to think about in South Africa are the criminal ones, the ATM um, uh, and the cash in transit vans that get attacked. Um, so those ATM bombings and those kind of things, they don't usually result in loss of life. In this particular case, they got it a little bit wrong and they blew up most of the money as well as, well as the van. Um, so, so that's, um, that's sort of on the funny side, but of course on the more serious side, uh, all around the world we're seeing terrorist suicide bombings. In this particular one in June, 150 people or more died because of a suicide bomber. And while these things happen everywhere across the world, the ones that we hear about tend to be the ones that affect the West, the ones that happen in Europe or in America, but actually they're happening east to west across the globe. Um, so, so that's sort of the, what we call in Bisri the generic terror slides, the ones to make you think about why we do this. Uh, but what exactly do we mean by an explosion? So when you think explosion, you think this, but I have to think in slightly more technical terms. And so sometimes I'm called upon by insurance companies or, or their forensic investigators to determine whether something was actually an explosion. And the way that we do that is we look at how much energy was released and how quickly was it released. So an explosion is actually a very rapid release of energy in a very short time. We're talking about microseconds usually. And that creates a pressure wave that moves outwards. And that pressure wave is the thing that does most of the damage. And in science and engineering, we classify explosions not by whether they were terrorist activity or accidental, um, or whether they were deliberate because they're in mining or they're part of your airbags in your cars. We classify them according to their source, by the medium through which that pressure transmits, whether it was in air, whether it was underground, whether it was through water, and how close you are to it, because how close you are to it determines the likelihood of damage and survival. 
So there are different kinds. One of the, the good kinds of explosions are the ones we call astronomical explosions. So that's what's happening on the surface of the sun as you're getting hydrogen converting to helium, huge amounts of solar energy released. And the picture you see there on the left, that's a solar flare. And those are violent enough explosions on the surface of the sun that we can pick up the differences. So we tend to think of the sun as a, as a big yellow object in the sky. And we, we often wish it wasn't there and it was raining instead at the moment. But, but it's actually a huge fireball of explosions going off constantly. And it's just that we're far enough away that it's not doing us any harm. Of course, on the more destructive side on the right, we have a, that kind of iconic picture of a nuclear explosion. And that's currently what the, the Americans are worried about with North Korea, having a, a nuclear detonation of some kind that may happen. So we thought that the nuclear Cold War was over, but it's just changed country. Um, so I can't protect you against those, unfortunately. Um, mutate today kinds of explosions that you might see or experience are the kinds of things that happen when electricity goes wrong. When you get arc flashes that vaporize metal or insulation, some kind of fault in your electric um, equipment or at the substation, that's what would have caused that explosion. But a very common kind of explosion that we don't think of as an explosion is lightning. So lightning bolts that fly through the sky, electricity, <laughs> that is superheating the air through which it travels. And that superheated air creates this high pressure wave that moves outwards that you experience as, as thunder. The sound of that is actually the sound of an explosion. So not all explosions are seriously damaging. And many of them are relatively common everyday events. Physical explosions are, are ones that happen when, say, a containment vessel ruptures. So if you have a, a vessel that contains some, um, some liquid, for example, that's under pressure, and then that ruptures. So let's say there's some corrosion or there's some kind of an accident and there becomes a leak in the vessel. Once the liquid escapes that high pressurized um, situation, it can be converted into a gas. And if that happens at a fast enough rate, you can get an explosion without any explosives and without any other, um, without any other cause, just due to this pressure drop. And those are called boiling liquid expanding vapor explosions. I, and those kinds of explosions um, you sometimes see in, in factories and process plants. Thankfully, not too often. But the ones where I've been really spending most of my career working on are two kinds called deflagrations and detonations. Deflagrations are what happen when gas explosions occur. So those are the kinds of things you see on offshore platforms where you get some kind of buildup of gas and it gets ignited. And we classify something as a deflagration if the blast wave moves slower than the speed of sound. If it's moving faster than the speed of sound, we consider it to be a detonation. And detonations are the things that invoke fear into most of us. So those are our landmines and improvised explosive devices, the terrorist activities, the suicide bombers, the things you see in war and conflict, but also the things that make your airbags work at the speed at which they need to deploy in an accident, and the things that make mining successful. So chemical explosions are not always bad things. They can also be useful things if we understand them properly and we control them well. So what happens after is this detonation? So we get this chemical reaction that happens really fast and this hot gas moves outwards under high pressure. We get a very sudden rapid increase in pressure that moves outwards. And we can also see if the container holding the explosive where it was with something other than air, if, if it's inside metal or plastic box, for example, we'll get fragments flying outwards. And terrorists like to pack their explosives with things that can do harm, such as nails or, or ball bearings. They're called nail bombs often. Um, and those nails fly so fast, like 600 meters per second, that's like almost at Mach 2. Um, and those can often cause more damage than the actual blast wave itself. So that hits you, there's a hole straight through you. If it hits an armor truck, you can have a hole, hole straight through the armor truck. And they're really serious and difficult to protect against. And that's, I promise, one of the only graphs in the talk. There are no equations. Um, something else that you get is this fireball. And the fireball can cause a secondary fire. And sometimes the secondary fires do more damage than the initial explosion. And we saw that in 9-11, which we remembered this week. 
um, in that the, the building didn't come down from the initial impact of the plane. It was brought down later because the fires weakened the steel inside the structure and caused it to, to collapse. Um, so th there are different aspects of explosions which are important to me as an engineer. The third thing that happens as time goes on is once the blast wave has gone past, you get this suction. That's a problem for glass because glass is fine under the initial load, but it often breaks out into the street because of the suction wave that comes afterwards and causes it to shatter. So those are all things that I, as an engineer, trying to protect against explosions need to think about. A further complicating matter is where does the explosion happen? And is that better? OK. Uh, if the explosion happens in an open place, the pressure can distribute and it can dissipate off. But if it happens inside a closed space, such as inside a mountain, you get these car passes. These are, this is in Norwegian, I think. Um, they've got lots of mountains that they put holes in for cars to go through them. Uh, we don't do that so much here. Uh, if, if there was an explosion in there, there'd be nowhere for the pressure to go. So it just keeps bouncing up and down and reflecting. And you get hundreds of times more energy to worry about if the explosion's confined. And that doesn't just happen in mountains with holes through them for cars to pass. It also happens in subway stations. So this was the, uh, the bombings from a couple of years ago now in King's Cross where what happened here was there was no space for the energy to dissipate. So you can see all the usual things with the first responders. What happened inside the subway tunnels, which were small, you can see they're circular, just big enough for a train, is that when the bomb goes off like that, the, the energy has nowhere to go. And so there's much more greater destructive power in that explosive there. You can multiply its energy. If there was more space, so if it had been in a tunnel where there was space for another train to pass by, you'd have had more, more volume for the pressure to distribute into and less damage would have been done. So those are some of the factors that I think about when I think about explosions. But you want to know more than just what I think. You also want to know what I do. So I'm, I've got three little case studies through this talk which will tell you a little bit about that. So uh, Alison referred to this in her opening remarks about me. I'm not sure where she got the information from. It seems she's also a very good researcher. Um, uh, but there are different ways in which we can measure what's going on. Uh, we can put pressure gauges in there, which tell us something about the loading. We can use lasers across which you get plates moving. You know, the kinds of lasers you see in the spy movies where people move and they set off bombs. We can use that kind of situation on purpose to record things. Uh, you can put things in the way that if they get hit, then you know how far it got hit and that's how far the plate must have moved. Or you can use uh, gauges that measure tiny little movements on the plate itself. Or you can use a camera system. And all of those have been used over the years. Uh, this is the original ballistic pendulum that Professor Nurek has spent most of his career working on. And the idea of this is at the front, we have some explosive that's mounted, there's a structure. And when we detonate the explosive, the pendulum moves. There's a pen at the back that records how far it moves. And, and that's sort of the original. That's what we were doing when I first arrived at Bisri. Um, we've since introduced a camera system now, the idea of putting a camera system inside a blast chamber where there's going to be an explosion is a very challenging engineering problem. We have those intense loads we just talked about that could multiply around an enclosed space. We have high accelerations, so the structures are going to gain speed really quickly. How do you film that? There's a really quick response. You've got the fireball, and cameras don't really like being made hot. Um, you've got this flash from the detonation, and that's what the picture there is showing you. How can you film that? Because it tends to white out. And then you get these high-speed cameras that could be flying towards these cameras that cost upwards of a million rand. So when I spoke to uh, Professor Nurek and said, wouldn't it be cool if we got a camera system? He kind of looked at me as if to say, that would be cool. <laughs> I'm not paying for it. <laughs> But in any case, we persisted and we did get one. And it did require quite considerable modifications to the original pendulum. So these are the two cameras. They, they will fit roughly inside. Each one fits inside my hand. The big part at the back is actually a big, what's called an aluminum heat sink. The cameras themselves tend to get very hot, and so the aluminum lets you conduct the heat away from the camera. And those big lenses on the front are for filming the back of the places it deforms. 
These particular cameras are rated for high accelerations, which is good because I give them high accelerations. And then what we did is we put the cameras inside this box, um, which I sometimes refer to as some kind of Star Trek um, sort of spaceship. Uh, and then the explosives on the outside, and the idea is that the flash and the gases and the fireball can't get to the cameras, which are safely inside that incredibly large structure there. Um, and then, this is the boring part from, from your point of view. You wanted to see flashes, and I know some of you hope there'd be a demonstration. There isn't a demonstration. Um, what we do is we paint the back of the plate, and we put this random speckle pattern on it, and then the cameras film that, and as the plate moves, the speckles move, and we have software that's able to track the speckles as they move, and the clever software is then able to tell me what happened to the plate. And so this is an example of what the software gives out. This is a strip across, across the center of the plate. And uh, although it won't be very exciting for you, this is exciting for me. So I look at that and I get excited. And that's why I'm not cool. <laughs> right, so. And then, yeah, so we can look at that again. And so we go back to the start. And this is all happening in microseconds, that movement that you see there. It started flat, and now it's deformed. And believe it or not, we can tell a lot about what's going on from that little video. And this is now, if we were to stop that at any particular point, what we can look at is how far has it moved. And the red indicates a lot of movement, and the blue indicates not very much. And then we can use that to draw these pictures, which if you were to take a flat plate and cut it in half and look at it as it was deforming, this is the kind of shape that you would see. And then what we do is we plot these kind of graphs. And these graphs show us what happens as time goes by. It, so the initial one is at 66 microseconds after detonation. It's already moved 10 millimeters, which mightn't sound like a lot to you, but that's fast. Um, and then it, it continues as the microseconds go on, and then it starts to rebound, and the black line shows me where it ended up at the end of the test. So in the old days, we used to blast and look at the plate afterwards, and we would see the black line. Now we can get a lot more information about what's happening. And so if we ever want to try and predict what's going on using computer models, we now have a lot more information to match against our models. And that lets us do better predictions. And then what I've done here is I'm looking at different distances away from the explosion, what would happen if my plates with those different positions. And these, the scales are the same. So what this tells us is that the blue line here is a, lot, is a lot smaller, which means that the further away you get, the less damage you get, which might sound like it's obvious, but it's nice to write a paper that proves it's true. <laughs> so basically, I often get paid a lot of money to state the obvious. <laughs> which is a great job if you can get it. <laughs> and then what we do is we increase the amount of explosive, and we can see now that we get more damage. And you might say, well, isn't that obvious too? And I say, yes, but I can tell you exactly how much more damage. Um, and that's what makes this cool for me. And then we use this to, to say, well, what happens if we keep pushing further? And the other thing we can do is we can take particular points on the plate. So we just took this point here on the plate at the center. We can plot what's happening with time, and we can see this rapid increase in displacement, and then it starts to oscillate backwards and forwards. And that tells me something about its structural response and how strong it is when it's finished. And then if, it, if we put too much explosive on the plates, what happens, I'll play that one again for you, because I know you all missed it, because it was so quick, is that, that little cap there was in, initially part of the plate. And what happens is when you load these plates too much is you get fragments that fly out after shearing off and they fly out at hundreds of meters a second and can cause a great deal of harm. We're not supposed to do that with our camera system. <laughs> so, so that was an accident, um, but a very nice accident because uh, you, you know it didn't break the cameras and we got a very cool picture. Um, <laughs> So not every experiment goes according to plan. So I have three rules for experiments for success. The first rule is nobody got hurt. The second rule is the equipment wasn't broken. And the third rule is we captured something useful. And most times I'll settle for two out of three. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so to try and answer the question I set myself tonight, can we really protect against explosions? Um, we have four ways we could try and protect against explosions. Prevention, redirection, transformation or destruction, and containment. 
So I'm going to briefly talk about each of these. So prevention means stopping the explosive from going off. So these are airport screeners of various different kinds. And if you've been to an airport recently, you've probably had an experience with one or more of these. Um, the, the bottom right, that's your luggage being scanned through an x-ray machine. The guy on the left here is going through you know, one of those fake now body scanners where you have to stand still. And if you don't quite stand still properly for long enough, they make you do it again. One of those ones, they're trying to detect whether you're carrying concealed weapons. And that's one at the top there, that's where they do an explosive trace detector, where they, they take the little cloth and they sweep your bag and they put it in the machine and they can tell whether or not you've got drugs or explosives on you. I've been caught by that one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> explosives, not drugs, I should, I should just say. <laughs> So uh, at Heathrow, I had to explain who I was and why it was that I had traces of explosive on one of my bags. Um, and they let, me, they let me live, and they let me out the country, which was good news. Um, so, so these machines really are effective, and they do pick up very small quantities of explosive. Um, and this is working. I have to say, this is the good news, is that it really is working. If you look at this graph, where, where the lines are high, that shows very high numbers of airport bombings. So if you look back in history in the early 1970s, which Alison described as an horrendous time before I was born, um, you saw there were quite a lot of bombings on airlines. If you look at recent history on the right-hand side, there are very, very few. But the thing is, very few is still more than zero. And so this is just a, a, an example of the most recent one from last year, where um, there was a, a laptop bomb that got past security at the x-ray scanners. Um, this was supposed to go onto a Turkish airline plane. Um, Turkey were being uh, targeted by ISIS at the time. Uh, but there, for some reason, the plane didn't go. It was delayed, and everybody was put onto Dalo Airlines instead. And uh, what happened was that the bomb went off early, thankfully, actually. It went off before they got up to cruising altitude, and it blew this little hole there in the side of the plane. And what happened was the suicide bomber who had the, who had the laptop, he died and was blown out of the plane and landed in a field somewhere. Um, and, uh, but there were two other minor injuries on the plane. But had this happened at cruising speed, probably everybody on board, which was another 70 or so people, would have died. Um, so, so that was, in one sense, a near miss. It was a terrible accident, tragedy. Um, but it was also a problem. And if you've ever wondered, why is this issue? Why do they make me take my laptop out of my bag and put it through the scanner separately? It's because they're looking for that green blob on the right-hand side. So what they do is they open up this laptop casing, they replace what should be inside with some explosive, a detonator, and some cables, and the giveaway thing for the people doing x-rays is the 9-volt battery being in the wrong place. That's to detonate the explosive. And so uh, it's amazing what you can find on Twitter. This is just on Twitter. This is not like confidential stuff I'm telling you. You can find this on Twitter. Um, and so, so, so that's, that's a terrible thing. And uh, this is a quote from, from 2013. I'm not a Daily Mail reader, usually. Um, but this was quite a good quote. It says, the fact are we are engaged in a technological race with terrorist bomb makers. Uh, they have sought to thwart detection with progressively exploding shoes, underwear. That's why I have to take your shoes off sometimes. Underwear, and now the human body. Scanning companies will one day find ways to detect explosives hidden inside the body, but the terrifying truth is the terrorists who are determined to find ways to kill people will always manage to circumvent any new system. Meanwhile, we're going to have to learn to live with the age of the human bomb. So the Daily Mail is a bit of a scaremongering extremist newspaper. So they kind of have a point, but they're also like playing to the, to the popular audience. Um, from an engineering perspective, He's talking about what we call body cavity bombs. And body cavity bombs are explosives you can put in your body cavities without being too crude about it. There are only so many cavities in your body that you can put explosive into. So we estimate that you can probably fit about two and a half kilos of explosive. And a human body is mostly water. I know those of you who like me a bit overweight maybe think your body is made of more than just water, but you're mostly water. And water is very good at dampening explosive effects. So from an engineering perspective, actually poverty cavity bombs are not really that big a risk. So he was exaggerating a bit. 
But is that really good news? Because in, with my engineering brain on, I can say, like, ah, it's not really a big risk. But when I think about it from a human perspective, and this is where I have the struggle inside myself with what I do, I'm talking about people who are desperate enough to pack explosives into or onto their bodies to try and affect some kind of change. So explosives strapped to the body is more effective uh, than a body, body cavity bomb. There's only been one successful body cavity bomb, um, and it, yeah, it's very difficult to make it work other than just to try and kill one person, and he actually didn't succeed in killing anybody but himself. Um, but it's not really good news. So these are some some pictures, are, the top picture is another kind of sensational picture from uh, a Canadian news, newspaper showing alleged ISIS bombers strapping explosives to pet dogs. Um, I don't know how real that is, but those, these are the kinds of things you can find on the internet. The picture in the middle is the one that for me I find difficult. That's a picture of a seven-year-old boy. He lives in the war-torn Iraqi city of Mosul, and he was found after hiding among fleeing families by soldiers who then managed, thankfully, managed to get that explosive vest off him. That boy is seven years old, so say age is my youngest son. And that's the thing that I find so hard about this work, is Technically, it's cool, but it's also about real people. And when I said I didn't want to go and be a doctor because I didn't want to be responsible for people's lives, I then went and became an engineer. And I'm not sure how well that's working out in terms of not being responsible for human lives. Um, so I will speed through the next little bit. So if we can't prevent every explosion, and we can't, the next thing we could do is we could, instead of the energy getting to somewhere it can do really serious harm and damage, we can try and redirect it to somewhere else. This is really good for a mine resistant ambush protected, or you might know it as a landmine protected vehicle. So the image that you see there on the left hand side is one of the best South African um, innovations in terms of this field ever. It's called the Casper. When the Casper was introduced, it has a V-shaped uh, bottom to it, and it works super well at keeping people safe if there's a, a landmine that goes off underneath it. And it's been exported all over the world. People love this vehicle. Um, so at Bisri, one of the questions we like to ask ourselves is why? Because when they design the vehicle, they put the V there, but they don't really know why it works when they design a vehicle in the 70s. But now we're asking the question, what's better? Is it better to have a V, which is what we have on the South Af African vehicle at the top? Or is it better to have this flat bottom, which is more uh, like what you've got on some of the um, Northern European country vehicles, which is better? There's lots of ways to answer that question. But from the point of view of what I'm talking about, we investigated this by doing scaled down modeling. And this is mostly what I spend my time doing. I try and look at real problems and think, how can I scale this down in my laboratory to understand the basic ideas of what's going on? So we take a landmine and we scale it down to a small disk of explosive. We take a landmine protected vehicle and scale it down to some kind of a structure I can test in the lab that literally I can lift up. <laughs> And this is a, a schematic showing, say, a V, a v structure with some explosive mounted to it. That whole thing would be put onto a pendulum. And we put the explosive very close because that's one of the worst cases when the explosive is close. And then we also do computer models. And this is a section through a computer model. Don't worry, I'm not going to explain how it works. Um, where we have combinations of the explosive, and we have the air, and we have this uh, sort of gray thing, which is the plate. And we compare our experiments to our explosives, and this shows something about how the explosion is predicted to impact on the plate for different shapes of plates. So if it's got a very, very sharp V, it's going to be very good at, at directing the explosive sideways. If it's flat, it's going to reflect the explosion back. And that's what you see on this picture is a lot of work's been done on the flat plates, much less work has been done on the V structures. But the idea of redirecting the blast sideways is one that's been really very effective in the Casper. And Steve and I do a lot of work um, looking at these V-plated v structures um, to try and understand what's the best V shape that we can get. and Is there any way of making a shape that's better than the V? The third way that you can protect against explosions is what we call transformation. 
Um, transformation at UCT has a particular meaning in our social context, but in our technical context here, what we're talking about is changing the character, actually maybe it's quite similar. We're talking about changing its characteristics so it does less harm. Hopefully at UCT we're not trying to sacrifice objects in its path. But, but in my work, we're sacrificing objects in the, in the path by destroying them instead of destroying something more valuable, like a person. And so how does it work? So if I were to go and punch Dr. Price in the face, I would probably break his nose or my hand. I would do some harm. But if I were to, to just lightly tap him on the nose over and over and over again, I would transfer the same amount of momentum, I would mildly irritate him, possibly get fired, but neither of us are going to have any kind of physical injury. <laughs> so the idea of this is to do something to the blast by making it travel through some other structure so that the thing we want to protect doesn't suffer injury. So in the, in the kind, what's a practical thing about this? So if I were to take this chair and then I were to stand on the chair and a bomb was to go off underneath the chair, the blast wave travels through the air and through the chair and into me and my legs get broken. If I have something that's protective, that, has, um, that absorbs a lot of the energy from the blast and transfers less load into my legs, my legs may survive. So if, I, if this is a landmine protected vehicle and I'm a soldier inside, what I'd like to have is something between the bomb and me that protects my legs so they don't get hurt. And that's the idea of transformation. And so what you want is a material that squashes a lot but carries very little load. And that's basically how these things work. They're called sandwich panels. The material on the inside squashes a lot so it takes in a lot of energy but it transmits very little load through it. And so they crush and they deform in other ways. And it takes a much longer time for that to happen so that the people on the other side are much safer. And, um, and that's really great. The problem with that method is that in practice in a landmine protective vehicle, you can't put this much material in the way. And that's how much material you need. So this is not very practical for a landmine protective vehicle, but if you're in a high-speed train, it might be useful because that can go into the nose cone. And it doesn't just work for explosions, it works for impact as well. So if you look at the high-speed trains that travel through Europe, they often have this rounded nose cone, and inside you've got an aluminium foam. If all else fails, so if the other three approaches don't work, don't let it break. Make sure the bomb stays where it is and that the effects stay within one location so that people in another place can be safe. And so what we look at, this is again aircraft. Two risks in aircraft is one, you get a hole in the plane and you get rapid depressurization because at high altitude the pressure is a lot lower than it is at, at our altitude. And the other risk is terrorism. By 2026, they're predicting almost 7 billion people traveling by air. So this is affecting a lot of people. Aircraft materials are mostly composite materials these ways, very lightweight materials, because if you have a plane, you want it to be light so that you can put more passengers and more cargo on the plane. And composite materials are materials that usually have some kind of plastic, and inside the plastic there are fibers that make it stronger. And one of the things I do is look at these different materials and try and evaluate them. So how do they retain their strength? Is it better to be strong? Is it better for it to stretch a long way? And part of the motivation for this is to look not just at the plain body, but also at the thing which contains your suitcases, which is where the bomb is probably going to be. Those things are called unit load devices. You've probably seen them at airports. They're those big silver boxes that seem to have the corner cut off them. That's where your suitcase goes. And so you have different ways of protecting people on aircraft, screening, um, making the aircraft stronger, but also making these unit load devices stronger. And uh, what they've shown is that if you change the material from aluminium to a hybrid material, which is called glare, which has composite layers and metal layers, you get better impact resistance, and they use that in the body of the plane, but you also get better blast resistance. And so I've looked at these materials. This is some of the work that I've done looking at the metal composite layers, and we put them into the blast chamber, and we looked at what they would do under different kinds of loads. 
And if you have a uniform blast, so that's one that's quite far away, and the load is pretty much the same all over the plate, they work really well. If it's more like a shoe bomber situation where it's right up against the, the material, then you get these big holes, which are very bad. I don't need to, you don't need to be an expert to know that. So some of the thoughts around this is that particular material is very expensive, so they're not going to use it for their unit load devices because it's not worth their while. So we want to look at hybrid materials that are maybe more sustainable, um, that are made from recyclable materials, perhaps thermoplastics, things that are cheaper, and also look at different methods of designing the inside of the materials so that they are more blast resistant. And so some of the work that we've done is look at different stacking sequences, different amounts of composite metal mixed together, different thicknesses, having a look at how they respond under explosions in those kinds of situations. So the bad news is that the material glare works really well, but it's expensive. But unless you're traveling with a particular Israeli airline that I won't mention by name, uh, they're not using them. Um, so we've come a long way, and most of you are still with me which is fantastic. Um, I know it's been a long day, so I will end just with this. An explosion is a fascinating extreme pressure load with devastating energy. We can't really protect you against explosions. That's the bad news. The real world's really scary, and there are some very clever people who are very bad that want to hurt you, or just have different ideas to you, or are desperate, and want to raise attraction to their cause. There aren't any simple answers to this. Prevention is better than screening. This is a bit like medicine now, actually. Prevention is better than screening. So making sure you're never going to get sick is better than trying to detect an illness. The same thing with an explosion. But prevention is more than just screening at an airport. It's about the kind of society that we live in and the inequalities that we live with. I went to a conference about a year ago um, it was more military focused than I'm usually comfortable with. And one of the men there does future predictions for, for the country. And he predicted that across Africa, there's going to be an explosion population. And that Europe is going to age and not really grow. But they're not going to let in the, the immigrants from Africa into the rest of Europe. And what that's going to do is, if we don't deal with the inequalities, is create urban centers of unemployed, desperate young people across Africa. And what's going to happen then is they're going to be radicalized. And then we're going to see sites of terrorist activity in the slums of African cities. And from his perspective, he saw this as a business opportunity. So they're developing ammunition that can shoot through mud walls. Why would you want to shoot through a mud wall? Wouldn't it be better if we developed a better society? So uh, we, it's not just me that's doing explosion prevention. We can all do explosion prevention. So screening is better than mitigation, and mitigation is better than nothing. I do mitigation, and it's better than nothing. Um, thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Professor Langdon. I'm not going to steal the thunder of, the, of Professor Rob Knudsen, nor the explosive impact he might have. Uh, he is the Chair Head of the Department of Mechanical Engineering, and I invite him to give the vote of thanks. Thank you, Dr. Price, uh, Professor Langdon, members of the uh, senior leadership group, uh, Gareth and, and uh, Jonathan and David, and of course the audience. Um, a, a great presentation, and I, I'm in a privileged position to be able to say I'm blown away by that talk. <laughs> <laughs> but I think the uh, moment of truth uh, is for me to really ask this question of David and Jonathan. David and Jonathan, do you think your mom is cool? <laughs> yeah? So, so, despite what uh, Professor Langdon has been uh, saying repeatedly through the talk, uh, she is cool. I think it's uh, absolutely a, a great achievement all around, and indeed uh, uh, 
uh, not only this presentation, but what she brings to the department and the university is absolutely fantastic. Um, I think your demonstration of the translation of highly destructive events into complex science and uh, engineering, which of course derives high benefit value to humankind, is is massively impressive. And uh, uh, long may it go on. It's clear, uh, Professor Langdon, that your dedicated research work provides an exciting platform, uh, something you didn't mention in your talk, but to train undergraduate and postgraduate students. And um, I think, uh, and also to connect with the international research arena. I think this is something that Professor Langdon is involved with on a daily hourly basis at, at work and I think it's something that she perhaps is is most visibly recognized for in a daily activity is not necessarily those uh, great number of publications that perhaps got you here to professor level but the way in which you engage with the with the body um, of students and um, I think um, in terms of the um, closing comments that you made about um, striving for, for indeed better behavior and, and, and better way people treat one another is something that, um, that you can build, particularly with the, the, the warm way in which you engage with the student body. And uh, I, I think we, we see it in a variety of ways uh, uh, in terms of the perhaps not uh, always immediately mindful of of how or why you're doing it, but the way in which you are transforming um, our department, our curriculum, um, and indeed our university. And um, we no doubt know that in going forward, uh, you will continue with your prestigious achievements, but in fact, you will continue to also bring uh, to uh, the university that sense of building people and building networks of, of students who no doubt will go out there and build a, a better South Africa and a, a better Africa. So thank you, Professor Linda. Uh, and let me add my appreciation to you and my congratulations, and perhaps especially the unexpected elements of the of the talk relating to compassion context uh, and the message that uh, we all are in the we all should be in the business of preventing explosions um, not just those engineers uh, who deal with the physics and science of it uh, a profound message and appreciate your introducing that so powerfully to us uh, ladies and gentlemen that brings our event to a close thank you all again for coming do look out for the other inaugural lectures. And if you'll just allow the platform party to leave, uh, we'll be up at the top in a, in a moment or two and you can sh express your appreciation and congratulations to Professor Langdon after the lecture. Thank you all for coming.